we doing tonight? Are we good? Yeah. Y'all are awesome. Oh my gosh. Hello. Thanks for coming out. Well, guys, I'm so excited for what God is going to do tonight. He has been absolutely blowing my mind. And here's the thing about our God. He goes from glory to glory to glory. So how many of you know that God's about to do something awesome in this room? Yeah? Yes. Awesome. So the theme of this year's tour is United We Stand, Divided We Fall, which is like this super huge theme, right? And I've been like so excited about it because I'm so excited about this concept of unity and what it looks like when the family, when the body comes together. And we were actually doing our little Devo earlier and the tour pastor, he said, Isn't it so awesome that when we come together, those are the times that we see God the most? Because when the body of Christ comes together, when the family comes together, we get to see so many aspects of who God is. And is that not true for us? Like, how many of you have personally been just blessed by unity coming together as a family? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, so I got to ask you a question. You see, I like the crowd involvement. I like to know where you guys are at. So how many of you have a desire for unity in your life? Yes? Okay, okay. See, y'all are a good crowd because like sometimes I'll come out here and I'll be like, yeah, God is good. And there's like one mom in the back. She's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, really? Because here's the thing. If we want to see unity happen, it's going to take every single person in this room saying, I want to be a part of what God's doing. And this is just really cool to me because Jesus, literally the son of God, his last prayer that he prayed on earth, which if if this is Jesus' last prayer, you, you would probably think this probably matters to him, right? The last thing he prayed was this. He said, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name that you gave me, which is the name of Jesus. He says, protect them by that name so they may be one as you and I are one. Then he goes on to say, I and them and you and me so that we may be brought into complete unity. I just love that. Jesus' last prayer was that we would be in unity. And so I was thinking, like, I want to come out and I want to give these people this message on unity, but I don't want it to just be, like, an encouraging message. Because doesn't everybody want to be united? Yes, but then there's obvious reason for division. Like, I don't want to come out here and just be like, you know, we're all in this. Like, no. Like, I mean, like, yeah, we all love Troy Bolton, a forever crush. But, like, that doesn't help anybody in real life. We, like, need practical, not just practical, but, like, very real things that bring unity into our life. And so I was thinking, God, like, I just want to go and I just want to bring your word. And so I was thinking, if you've ever like done a school project or maybe for your job, like if you're about to give a pump up, a message or whatever, but you want it to be genuine, the first thing that you would do or what I would do is I would look up a really good story to tell, right? And I'm like, man, if I could just find a good story on unity, that would be awesome because then I could prove that like, hey, if they did it, we can do it. Here's the problem. I could not find a solid story for unity. And it wasn't that there wasn't good stories on People United. It was that it always dissolved at some point. It was that maybe People United for a certain point in time, or maybe People United for a certain project, but then over and over and over again, somewhere along the way, there would be division and it would fall. And I'm like, God, like, this is not really what I'm going for. Like, I don't want to come up to everybody and be like, unity, yeah, they did it, and then it failed, but we can do it, woo. Like, no, like, that's just like not a great message. So it's like, God, like, show me when there was unity. Show me the story that, that I want to go after. And here I am looking for a story on Google. I'm like, 1940, unity. And the Lord's like, no, girl, you're going to have to go a little bit further back than that. So I'm like, 1840? No, 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 girl, keep going back. 17, no, the garden. Like, we're going way back. So next thing I know, I'm in the Bible reading about the garden because that was really the last time that there was perfect unity. That was a time that God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and mankind were in perfect unity and all things were good. It was the beginning of creation. It was going real smooth. Everything was good. And I look at that and I'm like, okay, well, if that's the last time that there was unity, surely you want it again. So God, what can we learn from the garden, from the original creation that maybe we've kind of missed at this point in our life? And one of the things that I would recognize that was in the garden that like we don't have, that actually was not in the garden that we do have a lot of now that I think is maybe the first thing that has to go if we really want unity, and that is comparison. 
Like, let's just go straight there. Comparison, gotta go. Because somewhere along the way, if comparison wasn't a part of creation, somewhere along the way, the enemy got us to look at each other, compare ourselves to one another, and compete with our own creation. And I don't know how that happened, but it happened. Because here's the thing. Comparison, like I said, was not even a part of creation. When God began to create, he was not comparing his creation. He was creating creation for its own specific good. Like when God created the sun, he said, it is good. When God created the trees, he said, those are good. When God created humans, he said, those are good. And so about that, does that not make you feel pretty good? Because like every other thing he created, he said it was good and he said I was good too. There was no comparison. There wasn't like, oh, he makes the sun and he's like, wow, this is amazing. And then like make the trees and he's like, those are so awesome. And then like make humans and he's like, they're good. Like, no, which is really awesome that he didn't do that. But I don't know why we do that. You see, because I would never walk past a tree and be like, oh, I just wish I was as green as the leaves. Like, that would be the weirdest thing ever. Nor would I ever, like, wake up in the morning, go out, like, open the window and be like, oh, my gosh, why do I even try to be a light? The sun's always going to be brighter. Like, no, I would just never do that. But why would I never do that? Because I'm not in competition with the sun. I'm not in competition with the trees. They were created at the same time as me, and God said they're good, and so I see them as good. So why don't we look at each other and just say, hey, you're good. God created you for a specific reason, for a specific purpose. Like... That is what's going to unify us. So, so real fast, like, let's just break the ice with your neighbor. I want you to look at your neighbor, and I want you to give them two solid reasons. Don't be like, your eyes are green and they're great. Like, look at the neighbor and be like, hey, you're good because this reason and this reason. Just go ahead. Just go ahead. <laughs> I love this. All right, all right. All right, are we all good? Are we good? Are we good? Everybody in here is good. We are good. I love that. Now, now let me ask you something. Who in here feels good? Yeah? Okay. Now, who in here feels strengthened? Yeah? Stronger? Yes. Okay. This is like, how easy was that? So easy. And how good did every single person feel? So good. And how strong do we all feel? So good. Don't ever let that stop. Like, if you see something good, call it out and call it up. If you see something good, say it. Why would you hold it back? It only strengthens. We were a part of a very, very good creation by a very, very good creator. And so let's step into the goodness. Gosh, it would just be, we would be so strong. I love that. This is what the garden was like. This is what creation was like. Unity with the Father, unity with the Creator, with the Son, with the Holy Spirit, and everything was good. Then we get introduced to this other word, and the word was evil. And like, I don't know about y'all, but to me, I'm like, why do we want to know what the other word is all about? Because the Lord gives clear instructions. He's like, hey, listen, guys. We're all good, huh? Everything's good, right? Yeah, okay, awesome. There's this tree, and this tree has the knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat from anything of this tree because everything is good, and you don't want to know evil. And so why in the whole world would you think that Eve would get it in her little brain like, I would just love to know what this whole evil thing's about. I really don't know. And like, I don't know about y'all, I'm not even trying to be funny. When I was a kid, like growing up in Sunday school and you hear like Eve ate the apple, I would always be like, why did she eat the apple? It's just an apple, they're not even that good. My mom makes me eat apples. Like if it was something else, give me a pizza, might be tempted. An apple, are you kidding? But like, you know what, that just represents mankind. Like that's just what happens when you see something that you think is gonna satisfy you more than what you already have in unity with the Father. So you break connection and you take a bite and you're like, ooh, that is not good. (laughs) That might be what evil's about. (laughs) And here's what the Lord showed me. Okay, how many of you are fans of Wi-Fi? 
Got any Wi-Fi fans in the house? I, I see some of you, y'all like 20 years old, you're not raising your hand, you lying in the church. So I'm gonna ask you again, how many of you are fans of Wi-Fi? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we all like Wi-Fi. If you don't like Wi-Fi, seriously, hello. But Wi-Fi is great. Wi-Fi is like the thing that connects us to the world these days. We get to, you know, connect, we get all accessibility to all things, it's cruising. Here's the thing. When I was growing up in my family, I always knew like the Wi-Fi at my house is just the best, you know, like my dad set it up for us. We got that network, Robertson, hey yo, there we are. And, like as soon as you get to the house, I would know as soon as I connect, Robertson, that's me. And all of a sudden, I had this great connection. I have all accessibility to the whole internet. I can talk to all my friends. I can communicate with anybody. I don't have to miss out. It's like safe network. It's reliable. It's great. This is the Wi-Fi at my house. And then I would always know, like, I don't know if any of you have parents like this or your parents have said this to you, but my parents would always say if we were going to go out of town or go to the airport, they'd be like, now, kids, here's the thing. When we get to the airport, nobody try to connect with any server that you don't know of because you never know if there's going to be, like, a hijacker and they're going to steal all your stuff. And we're all just like, ha, 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 yeah, okay. And as soon as you get to the airport, what do you do? You're like, <laughs> bing, which one's the least sketchy? You know, like, you're just cruising out your options, making sure, you know, oh, that doesn't sound that bad, right? Airport? Like, you're like, yeah, I got this. And why did we do that? Why did we choose to connect with something knowing that it might be a hijacker and all our stuff? Because we didn't want to miss out on what was happening. We didn't want to miss out on that connection that would give us accessibility to what the world's doing. We didn't want to miss out. And so here's kind of how I see it. This garden, this connection with God, the original design, like all of this, this is like the Wi-Fi at your house. Like this is good stuff right here. It's safe, it's reliable. Literally you have full connection with God. If you ask anything, it will be done. It's great. You have everything you need with this connection. You will not lack any good thing with this connection. But sometimes you're looking out in the world and you see some other options. And you know, you start going about your life, start getting in those middle school years, those high school years, those college years, and then you start looking at this connection that you have with God and you're like, this has been great, but I'm really interested in this, so I'm just gonna <laughs> disconnect with God, choose to connect with the world because you really didn't wanna miss out. Now you're in this connection, you're like, yeah, this is awesome, we having fun, woo! And then you're like, uh-oh, I didn't really realize that all my stuff was gonna be stolen. Like, I didn't actually know that my joy was gonna be stolen. I didn't actually know that my peace was gonna be taken. I, I, I didn't even realize that my confidence was gonna be, has anybody even seen my confidence? I didn't know that my stuff was gonna be stolen. And you might be sitting here right now and you're totally in this connection with the world. You totally just like broke connection with God just to see what this has to offer. And you're sitting here and you're like, oh my gosh, it has been seven minutes and I am swiped. Well, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you. Here's the thing about this connection. You know how like I talked about that Wi-Fi at your house being the best? One of the best parts is if you were once connected Honey, you're always connected because you're a part of the family. And here's the thing. We got this little nice password, password, hey yo, Jesus. And Jesus connects you back with the Father because here's the thing. This word says that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But the Lord says Jesus comes to give life and give it to the full. And so tonight, you might have thought, all of this has been stolen from you. You might have thought that it was all gone, but tonight, in the name of Jesus, your life is coming back to you. Your joy is going to be restored. Your peace is about to surpass all life's understanding. Your confidence will not be a self-confidence. It will be a bold confidence in who your God is. Like everything's about to change because everything's about to be restored. Everything you thought was gone is about to be found. Why? Because that is who our Jesus is. That is what he does. 
And you see, here's the great thing. You can always know that, and you can always claim that, and you can always say that because he never fails. Because he always does what he says he's going to do. And so I'm happy to share that with you tonight. I'm happy to say that and know that I know that I know without a shadow of doubt that that's what he's going to do. And so if you're sitting here in this room and you really need him to do that, I just want to say let your faith rise up. Tell your heart to believe, as that song says, tell your heart to believe that he is who he says he is. That he's going to do what he says he's going to do. And it's coming all back. So in this garden, what happened was she eats the apple. She breaks this connection. And this is kind of where that theme come, came from, united we stand, divided we fall, why the tour is called that. Because the minute Eve got distracted and took a bite of this apple, this moment of division literally caused the fall of man. So we were united, and we stood, and it was great, and it was good. And then division and we fell. And after this fall of man, what happened is this whole Old Testament book, it's just about us trying to find our way back to the presence of God. So they had temples, they had like the holy of holies, they had all of these things that it was very hard to get back to the presence of God. They built towers, they built walls, they did all types of things to try to restore that unity with the Father, but they just couldn't do it. And it was very frustrating. But there's this book, and it is an amazing story on unity. And I was reading it, and to be honest, it had been quite a hot minute since I had picked up this book. But it was so good. And I want us to read it because I want it to encourage us with unity, but also learn from some of the reasons why division took place. And the book is, blah, 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 drum roll, please. Nehemiah, woo, <laughs> betcha, weren't expecting that, but I'm telling you, it is so good. This book, Nehemiah, he is a legend, y'all. Like, I'm telling you, this guy's faith was like what I hope all of ours can become after tonight. So Nehemiah, if you don't know anything about Nehemiah, Nehemiah was just a cupbearer for a king. And if you don't know what a cupbearer's job was, let me just tell you, if you came in here tonight, a little ministry moment, and you've been having a bad job situation, your boy Nehemiah can relate. Because the cupbearer's job was literally just to taste the wine before the king drank it to make sure it wasn't poisonous. Real good. Like, you're either going to live or you're going to die at your job today. Like, that's, that's a rough one. So that's what Nehemiah did. But Nehemiah did it with all his heart. He was there to serve, and he did it well. Well, in this particular story where we pick up in Nehemiah's life, Nehemiah just got word that the Babylonians had just come in and completely destroyed the city of Jerusalem, set it on fire, the walls of Jerusalem were down, I mean destruction. And Nehemiah heard about this, and he was so broken by it because if you know anything about Jerusalem, these are God's people. Like, this is God's city. These are God's people. And Nehemiah loved the Lord. And so Nehemiah's heart broke for what he knew was breaking the Lord's heart. And so Nehemiah took this information and it said he began to weep because he knew that this was the Lord's place. These are the Lord's people. And he just was so frustrated and upset by what the enemy had come in and done. And so it said Nehemiah took this emotion and he began to fast and he began to pray on behalf of the Lord's people. And just that alone, guys, like that inspires me so much. Because I wanna ask us, and I really wanna encourage us and challenge us as a church family, that whether you are 11 years old or you are 91 years old in this place, I wanna encourage us and challenge us. Are we so broken and so bothered by what the enemy is doing in our generation to the Lord's people that we are choosing to take on what's breaking the Lord's heart and fast and pray for our generation, for our people, for the Lord's people? And I know that every time I say that, there's like this like silence in the room. Because it really challenges us because if we're all being so real, we're not. But I really do believe that it's that kind of passion. It's that kind of prayer that begins to move the power of God. And we really get to see this with Nehemiah because he takes this on and it says that Nehemiah continued to work as this cupbearer. But one day, as he was fasting and praying, it said that the Lord's hand was on Nehemiah. And Nehemiah goes up and, you know, he's testing the wine and he's giving it to the king and he's testing the wine and he's giving it to the king. And all of a sudden, the king notices the cupbearer, which doesn't really happen. 
And the king looks at Nehemiah and he says, Nehemiah, what is this face that you have on you? This burden on your face. He took notice of Nehemiah's posture. And Nehemiah looked at the king and he said, King, the city of Jerusalem is in ruin. The Babylonians had come and and they just completely destroyed it. And the king looked at Nehemiah and he said, what can I do to help? And Nehemiah was able to tell him, listen, if you would just equip me with the things that I need to go and rebuild these walls, then I'll take this on myself and I'll go rebuild these walls. And so the king blessed Nehemiah with everything he needed to get back to the city of Jerusalem. The king even sent an army with Nehemiah to get the job done. There's so much we can learn from this, but the first thing I just want to take away is Nehemiah was just a cupbearer. He wasn't even the king. And so I say that to say that you don't have to be the king to make a massive change in your generation. You don't have to be seated at the top of the palace to be able to make a massive change. You just have to have the heart and the passion and the prayer for the things that the Lord wants to get behind. And I'm telling you, the hand of God will come on you to get the job done. And you don't even have to do it alone because something God's really good at is sending heaven's army with you. And I just love that this is the character of our God. Somebody the other day, they asked me this. They said, Sadie, how do I know if it's like my purpose for my life or like the Lord's purpose and plan for my life? And I said, well, normally you can tell by this. If it's your plan and your purpose for your own life, at the end of the day, it's only going to affect you. There's going to be a lot of striving. You're never going to feel content or satisfied. However, if it is the Lord's plan and purpose for your life, one, it will prosper. Two, it will affect all of the Lord's people, not just you. Three, the Lord will get behind it and get the job done, and you'll never feel like you lack any good thing. He sends an army with us. So Nehemiah takes this passion, takes this prayer, takes this pursuit, and not even worried about, hey, maybe I'm just a cupbearer and I don't know how to build the wall. Like, I love how that wasn't even a thought. He's like, yeah, we're doing it. Because he knew that the Lord was in it. And so he takes his passion all this back to Jerusalem, and he gathers all of these people, all of these Jews and all of these people, and he's like, guys, we're going to rebuild this city. We're going to rebuild the walls, and we're going to make this happen. And it says in chapter 3, it's literally just like a long list of names. And I know sometimes, if we're being real, we skip over these parts of the Bible, but maybe it's just me, okay? I'm just being honest for the sake of vulnerability. Just kidding. But for real, like, this is such an amazing chapter because you actually get to see how many different people were working on the same purpose because it was something that the Lord had. You get to see this act of unity come together. And you see there's musicians coming just to play for the people as they work. You see that there's people coming to build the massive gate. But then you see there's people coming just to build the doorknob. Everybody is bringing their strength to the table and saying, I want to be a part of what the Lord's doing. And it's just so beautiful. It's such an act of unity. Well, then as everything's, everyone's excited, everyone's gathered, everyone's unified, and they're like, yeah, this is awesome. God's in this. We see like the most classic situation happen. Chapter four, we get a just classic hater shows up on the scene. And I don't know, that sounds kind of funny, but it's true. Nehemiah had haters too. But here's the thing. Like, I think that Just like comparison is one of those things that is a real reason for the vision. I think another one is that we let the haters stop the things that the Lord's wanting to do in our life. And how many of us have ever had a hater in our day? Yeah, yeah, okay. If you never had a hater, that is awesome. But they are real and they are out there. Go look at my Instagram comments. Just kidding. (laughs) Um, But for real. No, but seriously. (laughs) Their haters are just a part of the story sometimes. And here's the thing, it's so just like almost predictable that the minute that everybody's excited for what the Lord's doing, the minute they're like, we're building this wall, we're doing it, they all come together. I mean, don't you know that in your life to be true? The minute you're so excited for what the Lord's doing, you're finally gonna apply for the job, you're finally gonna take the class, you're finally gonna start the Bible study, you're gonna start the group, you're gonna write the book, you're gonna make the t-shirt, you're finally just gonna go for it. None other, no and behold, a hater shows up. And 
chapter four, we get introduced to the hater of the day, and his name is Tobiah. It's a strong name. He shows up on the scene, and I'm going to read the scripture exactly how Mr. Tobiah says it. I am not going to make it any more dramatic than it was because it is clearly dramatic enough. This is what Tobiah says. What are they even building? Even a fox climbing up on it could break down their wall of stone. <laughs> like, I don't know if he did the laugh, but it sounded necessary because, my gosh, like, how annoying is that? But how real is that? Like, as soon as you do it, somebody shows up and they're like, really, you? What are you even trying to build? Huh? Even a fox could come and break that down. Huh? And then sometimes you're just like, you right. Why do I even try to build? A fox could break this down. And like, that's whenever a lot of us are sitting down and stopping, but that's not the time to sit down. That's actually the time to rise up and become stronger. Because here's the thing, I love how he said it. A lot of times the angle that the haters are gonna go at is like, really, you? What are you even trying to build? And in those moments, the reason why I love it is because here's the thing, if somebody were to come up to me and say, really, you? You're 21, you can't do this. You, I'd be like, you're absolutely right. I can't do this. I have no idea what I'm doing. That's how good my God is. Like, <laughs> that is how good my God is. Like, when you start doing what the Lord has for your life, when you start building these things, when you get passionate, when you get prayerful, he's going to ask you to do things that are way out of the things that you know how to do. Like, it's gonna be insane. And what you're gonna have to do is just say yes and start building. Because, and when people come up to you and they see something built and they know, honey, you do not have all the requirements to build that, that's when they're like, whoa, this God of yours must actually be fighting for you. This God of yours must actually be real. And that's whenever he gets all the glory, when you literally cannot take credit for what's being done. It's amazing. And this is the way that they were positioning themselves to build because it was so for the Lord. It was not selfish at all. It was so for the Lord. And I love what happens right after this. All the people that heard them say that, it says, after they heard Tobias' comments, they all begin to work with their whole heart. How many of you know that we need to become a people who are wholehearted for what the Lord wants to do? And you know what one of my favorite things about the word wholehearted is? There's a synonym that goes with wholehearted, and guess what it is? <laughs> Unqualified. That's true, go Google it. When I saw that on Google, I said, wow, God. Because here's the thing, you don't have to be qualified to be wholehearted, praise the Lord. Like, you don't have to be qualified to be wholehearted, and then some of you just need to hear that. If your whole heart is beating for what the Lord, like, is going for, let me tell you, he does not need your qualification. He just needs your heart to say yes. And this is what these people are doing. So then Nehemiah, as this group leader, looks at them and he's like, hey, y'all, don't be afraid of them. And I love that. He's just like, don't be afraid of them. Who cares? He says, remember who our Lord, who is great and who is awesome. He is fighting for our families and he's fighting on our behalf. Then he goes on and he gives them this little new instruction. And he's like, y'all, we're going to have to like shift a little bit. We're a new strategy. He said, because our enemies, and I love how he says our enemies, they knew that like they're all working together, so anything that comes against them, that's all of their enemy. I think that's an important detail for later. He goes, our enemies are about to get frustrated by what we're doing. He said, so those who carry materials, do your work with one hand and hold your weapon in the other. And so that's what they begin to do. Then he said to the rest of the people, he said, a man who sounds the trumpet is going to walk around with me. The work is very extensive and it's very spread out. We are going to be wildly separated among us. But whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally together and know that our God is going to fight for us. So here's the thing, back in the day, when they were building this wall around the city of Jerusalem, it was not like a wall like around the stage. It was like miles and miles and miles away. And so Nehemiah is basically saying, hey, I know that the work is very spread out, it's very separated among us, but please remember that we're all building the same wall, we're all working for the same mission. And he says, just keep working with your whole heart, have your weapon at hand, but keep working with your whole heart. And he said, what I'm gonna do as the leader is I'm gonna walk around with a man with a trumpet. And this man with a trumpet, his position and his purpose was this, 
Anytime Nehemiah, being the overseer of this project, if he saw the enemy coming to attack, Nehemiah would signal the trumpet man to go around to where the enemy was attacking and to blow the trumpet as a signal that, hey, this is where the enemy is attacking us. Let's rally together and let's fight off the enemy together. But also know when we're fighting that we don't have to be afraid because the Lord's also fighting for us, which was just so much confidence that he gave these people. It was so beautiful. And as I was reading that, I felt like the Lord was like, that's the story. Like, that's your encouragement and that's your analogy to inspire the church. Because what if we had this like modern day Nehemiah scenario and all of these people from all of these different places came together kind of like right now. And we just were able to go around the room and we were like, hey, what's everybody good at? Hey, like, what's the strength that everybody can bring to this table? But instead of just building a wall and instead of just building this one project, we're actually building the kingdom on earth with the gifts that we've been given. And we begin to build and we begin to build the kingdom of God on earth with the gifts that he has so intentionally originally made in each one of us. And we would recognize that the person beside us, the fellow worshiper and the fellow worker beside us is not our enemy. In fact, we share the same enemy, right? Are you tracking with me? Yeah? So here's the thing. If we begin to see the one working beside us or worshiping beside us as our enemy, we are going to take out our own self. And that's a scary thought. We have to remember that we're building together. And that sound of the trumpet, what that is for us is the sound of our worship. It is how we fight our battles. It is the thing that we get to defend the enemy with. It's the thing he can't even stand against. When we release the sound of worship, the enemy must go. And not only are we fighting for each other on behalf of the church and on behalf of the family, but God is fighting with us when we call upon his name in worship. Such a beautiful thought. And I think that literally that can happen if we just begin to do it. The next thing that happens, like we're continuously learning from Nehemiah and just how he led and how these people worked together and how they went all in with their whole heart and all of these things. The next thing that we get introduced to is old Tobiah comes back on the scene. And Tobiah's first plan didn't really work. His whole hater game wasn't so strong. So he realized that like his commentary wasn't stopping this massive move of God. And so Tobiah's like, okay, plan A didn't work. Plan B, let's kill him. Simple. Take out the leader. Like that was the plan. It sounds like capture the flag or something. Like he's just like, go after him. And so Tobiah's plan was he's just going to invite Nehemiah out on the land and he's just going to kill him because why not? And when I read this strategy that Tobiah had, I'm not kidding you, I laughed out loud. Did I really laugh out loud reading the book of Nehemiah? Yes, I did. And I am not embarrassed by that because listen to what Tobiah says. He sends his little invitation to Nehemiah, you know, ready to kill him. And he goes, come, let us meet together on the plain of Ono. (laughs) Really? Like, can I tell you something? Uh, Let me just, let me just say it exactly how to buy it. If the enemy ever invites you to the plain of Ono, you probably should not go, okay? Like, it just kind of like has a sound to it. Like, Here's the thing that you have to know. Distractions have a ring to them. Like most of the time, distractions have a ring to them. Oh no, huh, probably shouldn't go. Like I think Nehemiah just heard it in the sound. Like I just should not go to the plane of Ono. And you know what your plane of Ono is. You know the sound of your distraction. Like can I be for real with y'all? Like every time you get on your phone, If you know that Snapchat is a problem for you and it is hindering your relationship with the Lord, oh no, delete it. Like, (laughs) uh uh-oh. Like, if you know that Instagram is causing you to lose confidence in who you were created to be and have negative thoughts and negative emotions, oh no, delete it. It's a distraction. You don't need it, it's fine. Like, if there is a party that you know, come on mama, if you know, if you know it's not going to be good for you, it has never been a good idea for you to go to, oh no, just don't go. Like, everybody hear me clearly when I say this, because a lot of you just need to hear this. 
you actually can decline the invitation from the enemy. Like, <laughs> you get to say, not a good idea. You can decline his invitation. You have the authority in the name of Jesus to say, no, I'm not going to that because that is a distraction. Here's what some of us do. We get invited, you know, we're just at home, and all of a sudden we just open the mailbox, and we're like, oh, invitation to the plane of Ono. And we're like, well, I got invited, so I guess I got to go. No, 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 no. You don't have to go. Don't go. It's a distraction. I love how Nehemiah handles this situation. Oh, man, he is a legend. Like, Here's the thing, if you don't know what to say next time you get invited, just like copy and paste Nehemiah because like he was so strong. He goes, I am carrying on a great project and I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it to go down and meet with you? Hmm, that is just so subtle but so strong. Here's the thing, like next time, you know, you get that invitation, you're like the point of, oh no, oh no, this is what you say. Um, I'm sorry, I'm carrying on a great project and not gonna be able to make it. Why would I stop everything that the Lord is doing in my life to go and to meet with you? It's just not gonna happen. You see, I declared this earlier, and I'm going to say it again. The Bible says that the Lord goes from glory to glory to glory. The angels who surround God day and night, the only thing that they can say about him is holy, holy, holy. What that tells me is God is a God of movement, and he's a God of consistency. He's not going to stop moving. The question is not, is God going to stop moving in my life? The question is, will I get distracted? Like, Will I get distracted and will I stop moving? Because he's going to keep going. Keep running the race. Keep running that race with him. Here's the great thing about running a race with God. You won't grow weary. You won't faint. You won't lose strength. You will only gain. Like it's so opposite of everything that the world can offer you. It's just who he is. So move with him. Build with him. Create. Do it all with him and you will not run out. The next thing that happens in the story, and it is just so, so, so cool to me. It's so opposite of everything we know, like I just said. Basically what happens is they build this wall fast. Like this wall, it goes up in double the time that they expected it because God was in this. And this verse, when I read it, it just stopped me. It said, when all of the enemies around heard about what God had just done in building this wall, they lost their self-confidence and became afraid. When I read that, it was a wow moment. That the enemies saw what God was doing, and they lost their self-confidence, and they became afraid, not the other way around. Because how many of you would say, not just the comparison, not just the haters, but it's also the very, very real spirit of fear and the very, very real insecurities and self-confidence issues that I'm facing. That's the very reason why I'm not going after all that the Lord has for me. Is it not true? I mean, I remember like my own story. If you ask me, Sadie, what kept you from going after the Lord? One, I would say my fear. Two, I would say my self-confidence and insecurity. And I think that that represents so many of us in here. It stops us from doing what the Lord wants to do because we're intimidated by the enemy. We're intimidated by the haters. We're intimidated by the world and the world's gifts and what the world's doing. And so we shrink back and we're like, yeah, I'm just going to sit this one out. Well, here's what I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you to do. If it's the fear if it's the insecurity, if it's the self-doubt, in the name of Jesus, will you lay it aside and will you just actually start doing what he called you to do? It's as simple as that. Start building. Start speaking. Start texting the scripture to everyone in your grade because you know that the Lord's put that on your heart to do. Like, start doing the things that he's asking you to do. And what you are going to begin to see is as that confident trust builds and as it rises, there's going to be a boldness in you that the enemy himself will lose his self-confidence and become afraid because of the authority that you're walking in in the name of Jesus. That is what happens. It's amazing. And it's going to start happening in, like, supernatural time. Because time is, like, just so, like, it's just so crazy to God. Like, 
I thought when I said yes to God, I'm thinking like, yeah, maybe by the time like I'm like 40, I'd be like speaking. I'm like one year later, and he's like, hey, go. And you know what? Did I think I had it all together? No, I knew I didn't have it all together. But I just kind of started talking about how I don't have it all together, but how good he is. And he just kept working with it. He just keeps working with you. He'll get you to the point. But really, it's not even about getting to a place. It's just getting to a place that you're so consumed and so in love with him that you'll say yes to anything he asks you to do. And that's what's going to take you to the next level of faith. And so anyways, they build this wall, and it's just amazing what happens. And then um, they literally gathered around each other, and Nehemiah is giving them this incredible message about this is whenever it says in the Bible, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Nehemiah is the man that said that. He was just praising God for what God was doing and what he had already done. And Nehemiah was stoked on what was happening. And something that I take from this book that I really want us to do today in this room is whenever they built the wall, Nehemiah was so encouraging. He would always say things like the joy of the Lord is our strength. He would always say things like our God is fighting for us. He would always say things like don't be afraid. Nehemiah, he never panicked. He never felt like I don't have something that I need to build, or I don't have something that I need to fight the enemy. And as I study this book, what I noticed is any time there was a threat to Nehemiah, or any time Nehemiah there became opposition, or there became like a big task, Nehemiah wouldn't go looking around. Nehemiah would stop where he was, and he would ask everybody, he would say, let's just pray. And he would say, Lord, would you strengthen the hands that we've been given? Would you strengthen the hands that we've been given to fight? Would you strengthen the hands that we've been giving to build? Because what Nehemiah was recognizing is that they had everything that they need among each other. And we kind of talked a little bit about how sometimes what we've done is we've stepped back because we just kind of let the world go on with their gifts and their talents and we cheer them on from the sidelines. Because the world is really good about celebrating gifts. They're really good about broadcasting gifts. I mean, think about it. Our, like, TV, it's all, like, sports related. Or it's America's Got Talent or American Idol and all of these things. And we celebrate the gifts that people have been given. We celebrate the talents that they've been given. And that's great. There's no harm in that. There's no hate in that. But what I'm saying is if the world's doing it, why isn't the church? Because if the world is just having this epiphany that, wow, we're gifted, so we're going to sing. Wow, we're gifted, so we're going to play sports. Wow, we're gifted, so we're going to show our talents. And they're doing it, knowing that those talents will eventually run out and they are temporary. Why in the world is the church not doing it when we have gifts that are promised to us, that go beyond talent, that go beyond gifting, that actually have purpose and meaning and value that go into eternity? And I think that that reason just is because of the thing that we've been talking about, that fear, that self-confidence, that maybe fear that it's not going to be enough. Maybe it's the lie that you believe that why does it matter? It's just me. I'm just this age or I'm just one person. No, let me just speak against every single one of that. And let me just say, would the Lord strengthen not only your hands, but would he strengthen your faith to believe that you are a part of building kingdom on earth? That the family, we need you to show a new side of our creator. That the very way that somebody else is going to experience God is through the way that you begin to love on them through the gifts that you've been given. First John chapter four. And tonight, I just, I don't want to miss that. So, so just right now, let's just do it right now. I just wanted to give a call. If you're in this room and like, you're so ready to just like go after what the Lord's doing. You're not going to wait on your circumstances to change. You're going to ask today that your heart changes. You're ready to ask him for the strength that you need, for the joy that you need, for the peace that you need, for the confidence that you need. And you're ready to say no more fear, no more insecurity, no more self-doubt, no more lie that I'm not worth it, no more lie that my circumstances get to dictate what my situation is. Then I want you to stand up to your feet right now, and I want you to put your hands out like this. Awesome. I love it. Yes. So good, y'all. I mean, only stand if like you're really, you're really gonna go for it. 
I think this is beautiful. And I, I just want us to all just have this moment right now where we look around this room and we just recognize that, you know, sometimes we're like, is God really moving? Is he really doing things? Yes. <laughs> he really is. Tomorrow is going to be a lot different because people are actually saying yes to everything that he has. I want you to just notice that everything, everyone in here is about to have something really awesome in common. That they're about to start going wholehearted for what the Lord's doing. And so I'm just going to pray over us, just a prayer that we would be strengthened. God, I just thank you so much for these amazing people in this room, God. I thank you for the ones who are standing to their feet so boldly and so confidently, believing that there is more for them in life, God. God, I feel like the people here that are saying they already believe in you, but they believe in who you are enough to know that you go from glory to glory to glory, that you are holy, 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 and that there is always more. So God, tonight, I ask for the more. God, I ask for the more in their life. God, I pray that they know without a shadow of a doubt that you are there with them, that you are the one that will fight on behalf of their family, that you are the God of provision and you will provide all of their needs that you are the God of their strength and you are their refuge, that you are the God that keeps them in a safe place. God, I speak right now in the name of Jesus and I say that fear no longer has any authority over their life. It has to go in your name. God, I speak that self-doubt, that shame, that all of these things, God, that are not of you would have to go in the name of Jesus. They're no longer going to be a burden to them, God, because right now I believe in this moment that you're taking that from them. And God, I pray that you give them a new spirit, a spirit of praise, a spirit of joy, of strength, of dignity. And God, right now in this place with hands lifted all around the room, God, I pray that you strengthen the hands in this room to know that they have everything they need just in your name to build kingdom on earth and to not have to fear the enemy. God, I also pray for their hearts. God, would you strengthen the hearts in this room to believe that you are who you say you are and that you're capable of doing all that you say that you can do. We thank you, Lord, for the movement. We thank you, Lord, that you are good. And the church says together, amen. Now y'all just stay standing for a minute. Because here's the thing I want you to do, because I want you to hear you say it. So for me, I remember being at a conference in my life. It was the first time I said yes to God. The first time I was like, you know what, God, like, not just yes. Like, I was already a Christian. I already believed in God. I'd already been baptized. But at this moment in my life, I was like, God, I'm going to say yes to actually speaking your word, because I believe that that's what you're calling me to do. I remember this was four years ago. And I remember, like, so vividly just being like, yes, God, I'm doing it. And, like, after that, I remember, like, every day when I would, get a, when I would start to feel like, did I really do that? Did I really say that? I would, like, no, yes, I really did. I really did say yes. And that would, like, push me to keep going. And so tonight, I want everybody in this room, when I count to three, to say yes. That way tomorrow when you're like, did I really, did I really, yes, you did. And you all heard it. Like, I want it to be so loud in this room. Like, you're saying it not to me, not like you're saying it to the person beside you. Like, you're saying it to the Lord for him to hear and keep you accountable to the yes that you made in this room tonight. So on the count of three, would you just lift it like you are just praising him in this room? One, two, three. Yes! Awesome. I love you. I love you. All right, y'all can sit down. This is amazing. How many of you feel that God is already doing something in your heart tonight? Yeah? 